we've talked a bit about proteins and their structure and how they're made up, and we even looked at examples of some, of some proteins. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of the chemistry that goes into proteins and how they can be um, hydrolyzed and broken down. And this is not only chemistry that can happen like in vitro in a test tube, but this is also the same chemistry that happens in vivo inside of our bodies, for instance, whenever we're eating and digesting food. Uh, so protein hydrolysis is breaking the peptide bonds that link the amino acids together in proteins. Um, so again, hydrolysis means we're going to use water to break those bonds, and that the reaction of the protein with water to break the bonds can occur in either acid, base, or be a reaction that's catalyzed by particular enzymes. So enzymes that occur um, in the body or that exist in the body are things like pepsin, right? This is in your stomach and your gastric juice. And you also have enzymes, um, trypsin and chymotrypsin and pepsinogen, um, as well as uh, many other different enzymes that can work to help break down food in the intestines and other areas as well. So these enzymes can work physiologically. If we were to take a protein and want to go into a lab and do it, we can do it in acid or base conditions. And furthermore, if you remember, in our stomach, it's a very, um, very acidic solution there. The pH is about 2. So somewhere around pH 2, which is very acidic. So that also helps break down the proteins as well. So the idea here is we're going to hydrolyze specifically the amide bonds. So the amide bonds or the peptide bonds of the protein are going to be broken down into the individual amino acids. So what does this look like chemically? So let's just kind of simplify this to a tripeptide, right? So here we have isoleucine, glycine, then phenylalanine um, all linked together here. So again, a, a naturally occurring protein would be much bigger. Usually they're in the you know, hundreds of amino acids long, but that doesn't fit on a slide here. So what we're going to do here in terms of breaking this down is we're going to break the peptide bonds. So the peptide bonds are the ones shown here in red, and those bonds are going to be cleaved like this, and they're going to be broken down. And they're broken down with water. So remember, water we can write as H bound to OH. All right, so H and an OH. So what's going to happen whenever we break the bond? I'm going to take the isoleucine just like it is and rewrite it. So I'm going to write this down as H3N plus CHC double bond O. And then down here, this would be the side chain for isoleucine like this with a CH3 over there. Okay, so whenever if we were looking at this as an individual amino acid, what would happen is that this OH would come down here and we would form the carboxylic acid. So I'm going to write the new OH that would form there in red, and that would be our product. Now again, this product that we have down here, um, could vary depending on the pH. So if this was done in acidic conditions, it would look exactly as I have it now. If this was done in neutral conditions, like pH 7, keep in mind that we would then um, basically lose this H here, and that would become a minus, right? It would form the negative charge because it would be in that Zwitter ion form. So again, just remember the acid-base properties of this. And we would go through and do this for the other amino acids as well. So if we wanted to come down and break it and look at glycine, right? So glycine, we would have kind of an NH. We would have a CH with the HR group. We would have the C double bond O. In this case, um, the OH would come down here, and you would form the COH. The H would come down here, and you would form another H. And again, depending on the pH, you might have to change this one to an NH3+. Plus, right? So usually, unless you're doing this in a basic condition, that's going to be an NH3+. Plus. So if you're at pH 7 or um, pH 2, like if you were doing this in the stomach, that's what you would see. Um, and you could do the same thing for the phenylalanine. I'm not going to draw it a third time. Hopefully you guys uh, understand it based on those two drawings. So again, 
The idea here, you're breaking the amide bond or the peptide bond and separating it into the individual amino acids through a reaction with water, and that's why it's called a hydrolysis reaction. Now, hydrolysis is different than denaturation, so make sure you don't uh, mix the two. So hydrolysis is chemically breaking a bond. So you are breaking a covalent bond. That peptide bond is a covalent bond, and you're breaking it into individual amino acids. Now the difference here, this slide shows denaturation. So denaturation is whenever you take a globular protein that's folded like this, right? Maybe this is the N-terminus and that's the C-terminus, right? So you have an N-terminus and your C-terminus of your protein. And by heating it, by shaking it, by treating it with an acid or a base, you do something to denature the protein, which basically makes it lose its tertiary structure. So now you can imagine down here, maybe you have the C-terminus and the N-terminus, and they're no longer right next to each other in solution. You lose all the coils and loops. And I stole this slide from the book, and they had a typo there, right? So it's going to lose the coils and loops. Um, so... Denaturation is altering the shape of the protein without breaking the peptide bonds, the covalent bonds that link everything together. So notice, all of these proteins, or all these amino acids are still linked together by peptide bonds, right? Imagine every one of those spheres that's kind of smushed together is linked together by a peptide bond or an amide bond. We did nothing to break those in the process of denaturation. So again, denaturation can occur with heat, it can occur with pH changes, and it can even occur with agitation or shaking a protein a lot. Um, so denaturation uh, makes less proteins less water soluble. So an example of that is um, ovalbumin. So ovalbumin is going to be the main protein in egg whites. So if you think about it, if you were to crack open a raw egg, you have the yolk, which is kind of yellowish, orangish, um, and you have the egg white. And we call it an egg white, even though in a raw egg it's pretty much clear, right? So it's clear and colorless. However, if you put it in a skillet on a stove, after a minute or so, it's going to turn to opaque and white. This is from the protein being denatured. So whenever it's denatured, it's going to lose its three-dimensional shape, which allowed it to be clear and colorless. It becomes denatured. The denatured protein is less water-soluble, and it's going to turn into this opaque um, and white. It's going to have this opaque and white appearance whenever all that's done. So again, denaturation and disrupts the non-covalent interaction. It's going to break the hydrogen bonds. It's going to break, um, so here, the non-covalent interaction is going to break the hydrogen bonds. It's going to break the electrostatic bonds. And it could also break the London forces. right? So it's going to pull those particular bonds apart. It is not going to affect disulfide bonds because disulfide bonds are covalent. Right, so just the hydrogen bonds, electrostatic forces, and then the London forces.